for all verified facts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome. The number of cases, uh, COVID-19, of course, continue to rise across India and more so in some states and particularly cities like Mumbai. Uh, one of the concerns that's uh, arisen and uh, is uh, is still festering in some ways is whether uh, new mutants are driving this rise and some of these mutants could be coming in from other countries or may have even uh, uh, been created uh, within the country or have uh, been sprung within the country. But the larger question in some ways is uh, what are mutants and what are these mutants? Why do they spread the way they do? And should we be more concerned about mutants than we were concerned about the original virus? And when do uh, viruses start mutating and why do they mutate in the manner that they do? And essentially, can we better understand uh, mutations and the role of these mutations in spreading the virus at the speed at which they are currently? And uh, maybe that will give us some uh, relief hopefully. To understand this uh, uh, better, I'm now uh, joined by Dr. Jeremy Camel, uh, Associate Professor, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at the Louisiana State University uh, Health Sciences Center at Shreveport. He is also a director of the COVID-19 Viral Sequencing Project. He also holds post-doctoral fellowships from Cornell and Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Kamil, thank you very much for joining me. So let me start off with a very simple question so we can lay the foundations. Uh, what is a mutation and what do we understand of the term mutation in the context of a virus like COVID-19? Well, um, the simple thing is that everyone should be re reassured that mutations are normal. They happen every time the virus replicates and most of those mutations are uh, meaningless from a uh, danger standpoint. The um, things get interesting and newsworthy perhaps when you start to talk about things called variants of concern or variants under investigation. And this, this refers specifically um, almost always to mutations in what's called the spike protein of the virus or the gene that encodes the spike protein to be more specific. And so, these, I would say mostly viewers should not be too alarmed when they hear about a new variant in the newspaper. It just reminds us that the pandemic's not yet over. The virus is always, um, every once in a while, a mutation will happen and it's like the virus won the lottery. I told you that most of those mutations are, are meaningless, but every right. once in a while, the virus will, um, what, we, what they say is explore sequence space and by, by chance, it will find a mutation that helps it get into human cells a little bit better or to escape an antibody that was made against uh, an early wave pandemic infection. Uh, the, but keep in mind, the virus is not a super virus. It has no magical abilities that, that it uh, compared to other viruses that can make us sick. Uh, so this is all normal stuff that we should expect to see. The, the, the important thing is to keep in mind to, to wear masks, to socially distance whenever possible from people outside of your household. Um, and to get a vaccine as soon as you're able. And those are the same messages right. at the beginning of the pandemic. Right. So uh, so any virus will and can mutate. Uh, a flu virus, for instance, would also do the same thing. Yep, every time. Every time they replicate, they make mutations. It's just like a typo. Like if someone asked you to copy a book by hand very, very quickly, you might misspell a, a letter or two, no matter how good you are at copying. And the virus is no different. It has to copy its genome and it does it um, you know, only somewhat faithfully. It makes, it makes little mistakes every time it copies. And some of, those, some of those mistakes kill the virus. A lot of the mutations are lethal to the virus and you don't see those because they die. So the, there's ones, the ones that you see are either neutral, they ride the coattails of uh, the rest of the virus genome or uh, mutations that are a little bit more fit. And these are small differences. The, the, the virus isn't magically evolving to be able to drill a hole in your mask or to do things that it couldn't do before, really. Uh, so there's nothing to be so alarmed about, except do, do have some awareness that there are variants now like B117, which was first described in the United Kingdom, but of course, it's made its way to India and lots of parts of the world. And in some countries, it is now the major virus around. So because it has some significant advantage um, over the parental virus and spreading from person to person. But again, right. it's not such a big deal. Right. And, and you said that uh, many in, in, in the case of some mutations uh, that causes the virus to die. So that's also been happening with uh, COVID-19. Would that be a safe assumption? It happens every time the virus replicates there are defective, defective um, 
viruses that are unable to infect another person or to complete their replication cycle. But those are not selected for, they're selected against. So you don't see them so much. Right. In sequencing, now, you don't detect those. Right. Now, now tell us about how viruses or their mutations behave when it comes to geography. So why is it that some mutations seem to uh, gather more steam in some uh, countries or geographies, or maybe it's some other factor which you could tell us about? Well, I think the most important factor that influences all this is something called undersampling or disparate sampling. And that's just a scientific word for some places are doing a better job sequencing and sharing their data in real time than others. So there's a really important initiative called GISAID, which um, is spelled G-I-S-A-I-D, and it's for sharing pathogen sequence data in real time. And they really protect the rights of the authors and scientists in countries like Bangladesh, Brazil, India, South Africa, but even in states like Louisiana. I work in a state in the United States that isn't as wealthy as Massachusetts or California. And if it wasn't for GISAID and me sharing that data in real time, I wouldn't have had all the news coverage and the um, scientific paper that came from collaboration with other scientists who saw my data on GISAID, but they knew when they saw my data that they were bound by the same data use agreement that I am, which says I cannot release sequences or uh, use someone else's data who they, sh they, sh they, sh they trusted the community, they shared it in real time, right. but they shared it under an agreement. So. So that means that when you share in real time, you get rewarded because no one can use your data without attributing it to you. And you're encouraged very strongly to co collaborate with others who share. So if it, when, so the problem is we're hearing a lot of news reports of, oh, this virus came from you know, England or this one emerged, this double mutant from, from India, but there's viruses coming everywhere. Some places are either not sequencing, not sampling, or they're not releasing their data in real time. And so if you sit on your data for two or three months, all of a sudden your data is less valuable. It's not news anymore. Who wants to read the newspaper from three months ago if you could read today's? So you, you need to release the data as soon as possible right. to save lives, to understand the virus. Right, so you're saying that, uh, I mean, from your experience, you're, I mean, you're, you're saying and you're concluding that because uh, we are only seeing data from some places, uh, it does not mean that there is no uh, mutant or mutations uh, uh, swirling in other places. And it's only exactly because we don't right. have the data that we don't know. Exactly right. You, you, it's like turning the light on. If, if it's if 90 percent of the world is dark and you're only looking at 10 percent and you see a scary insect or something, you'll say, oh, my gosh, where the light is, is a scary insect. But there's a whole universe of insects in the dark that you're not seeing because you don't sequence there, you don't share there. Or maybe the people are hiding in the right. dark, holding on to their little treasure, their special little thing that they think is so cool. They want to look at your data, but they don't want to share theirs. Well, you know who loses from that? The person who thinks they're they're uh, better off holding their data. And the public health, the people who don't find out about a new variant. Let's say there is a new scary virus, but it didn't, but it got sequenced. But someone who understands what that means, maybe they're in Brazil, maybe they're in uh, a different country that that might collaborate with you right. to help you understand that oh this mutation on your spike is similar to one we saw in our village and let's talk let's collaborate and then you could have a paper in nature or science or cell but if you sit on your data you lose that you lose it and someone else and, finds and, it later right and and i'm i'm guessing that you're also saying that there are uh, countries uh, or geographies which are clearly not sharing as much data as you could because uh, sharing the data might actually create a sense of uh, yeah go ahead yeah, no, exactly. Sharing in real time creates make the pie bigger. So often in science, and I don't blame scientists, we're all used to this economy or this ecosystem of competition. So we're all we all think, oh, well, it, you know, if I share this right away, someone else might take it because I'm I'm competing for the same grants with them. I'm trying to get into the same journals that they are. But with this rapid data sharing, it's really a situation where you can make the pie bigger. You can, you can have more to share because the public understands more than ever before that viruses are around. We need to know what they look like and how they're evolving to protect human health. And also to inform, you know, when your child goes to school, comes home with a fever, oftentimes you don't know what virus that was. But we are now, no, we are now knowing world leaders in India, in Europe, in, in South Africa, in Brazil, 
everyone agrees now. The United States, rich, rich and lower middle income countries, quote unquote, poor countries, developing countries, whatever you want to call them, everyone is going to be sequencing like a utility. Sequencing should not be research. Right. It should be a utility like the weather. Like, like you, you should know when you wake up in the morning, you should be able to see a number that says, here's my infectious, infection risk score. And I can tap that number and see that, oh, the, the risk of this respiratory virus is a number four. And the way to protect against it is to wear a mask. Um, and then some child who goes to school, they can find out that their cousin had a fever and they sequenced it and they could look on their computer and say, oh, this is the virus that made my cousin sick. And we all shared it under some kind of um, cooperative agreement so that no one is having their data taken from them and published about if you sequence in India and you find a cool virus, someone in, in London shouldn't publish it about it without involving you as an right. author. And so that's what GISAID is all about. It's, it's uh, this real time data sharing is about equity and being and fair and honoring everyone's contribution. And that's critical to, uh, to understanding the spread of the disease. So, uh, you know, uh, in India, uh, we peaked uh, towards the end of September 2020 and uh, it, it was on a steady and downward uh, trend. And suddenly in uh, last month, uh, uh, it, it started picking up in, in the month of February. It started picking up. And now as we enter April, it's uh, it's skyrocketing once again. So what so do, do mutants play a role in this? And uh, and if not, then what? could, from your understanding, drive this sudden spurt, apart from the obvious changes uh, in behavior, which is people taking it easy? Yeah, so like you said, people's behavior is the number one driver. The other is um, you do have variants now that do two things. One, they're in inherently able to spread faster. And that the, the archetype or the prototype of that, uh, the best example of that is B117. It definitely spreads faster and it's actually a little more dangerous. However, B117 is easily to controlled by all the current vaccines. The ones that are uh, in the other category that might be leading to a surge are viruses that have mutations on the spike that allow them to escape or resist antibodies that were, were elicited or came when people recovered from a case of COVID-19 early in the pandemic. Um, these viruses like B1351 and, and another one called P1, they can infect people who already have antibodies. They don't make people who have already have antibodies very sick, but I would call that penetrating herd immunity because now this virus can hop between people who already can resist B117 and all the earlier virus until they find someone who has never gotten infected. And that person has a risk of getting pneumonia or ending up in the hospital or dying. So that could also play a role in this surge of infections. And we know we see this all over the world now. And just like this double mutant uh, that was identified in India, it has a mutation called E484Q. And the 484 position on the spike is uh, known when it changes to a K, which is, which is a lysine. It's known that that escapes antibodies quite well. And it's also known that when it changes to a Q, um, in laboratory experiments that that escapes antibodies quite well. It doesn't mean it escapes all antibodies. So if someone gets in infected with a virus that already has a Q or a K there, their antibodies will protect them again from being infected. But if they were infected by the parent virus, the older virus, that, that mutation can help the virus maybe infect a few cells in their mouth and their nose. They will not, again, be likely to be very sick, but they could transmit the virus from person to person. So the second wave, I would say, is probably contributed to by variants and two types, ones that, that transmit more rapidly like B117 and ones that escape antibody responses. And your double mutant that was found in India has also been seen in a lot of other countries by now. And so that one probably ha also has some advantage in this uh, escaping from antibodies. Maybe it spreads a little faster too. I think the WHO uh, has a list now that they maintain and some people do think these P1 and B1351 not only escape antibodies, but also spread a little faster. So yes, right. variants are probably right. contributing. Right. And uh, in, in, uh, in your understanding and studies, uh, are there any external factors that contribute to it? For instance, uh, you know, last year in, in summer, as it is right now here in India, we, we, we thought that maybe as temperatures rise and there was some, uh, 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 there were some uh, writing to that effect that as temperatures rise, maybe uh, the virus would not uh, transmit at the same intensity. But clearly that seems to be not be the case because it's summer once again uh, here and uh, and the virus seems to be spreading. So are there any other external factors in, in your mind which either work uh, to uh, spread the distribution or to curtail it? 
Well, I think the seasonality of the coronavirus is probably in large part driven by, again, what we would generally call human behavior. Because in the United States, look, this virus likes to spread indoors in crowded areas that do not have great ventilation. So anytime that people like to get together in a restaurant or if there's uh, religious holidays or cultural events where people are gathering together indoors and doing the things they love to do. We like to socialize. We like to see our families. And in India is a populous country with people who have big families and big communities. And it, any time of year, whether it's summer or winter, if people are gathering indoors or crowding together on a bus that has the windows closed, that's going to be a perfect environment for the virus to spread. And these, vi these variants like B117 probably spread even faster and need less of the confinement and uh, poor ventilation than maybe the, the older strains. But still, they're all going to benefit a lot from people gathering together indoors. So if you're gathering together indoors with people who you do not live with, I recommend you wear a mask and that you ask others to wear one as well. That just protects everyone until we get vaccines. Once we have everyone vaccinated and the case numbers go down, we can relax the masking. No one likes wearing a mask all day. It's not fun, but no, but we like it even worse when someone we love is very ill. So I think, you know, you, you, right. you do what's best for your uh, family and your, your right. friends. So, uh, Dr. Kamen, as, you, as, as, if, as we look ahead now, uh, we're maybe depending on which country we are, uh, uh, somewhere uh, maybe one third of the way to vaccination uh, or, uh, uh, or at least, uh, you know, being in a better position to control the medical uh, let's say, outcomes of people uh, falling ill and uh, even going into, let's say, uh, uh, intensive care unit. So what are, what are you looking at and uh, how, how are things looking to you uh, at this stage of either vaccination or, and spread of disease? The thing that worries me most right now is not the situation in Europe and especially United States. The United States arguably been been quite greedy about protecting itself. I mean, we're doing a great job vaccinating our people. What I worry about most is that uh, countries that don't have access to enough vaccine. I mean, we're all in this together. The virus is a pandemic. It's a worldwide virus. And we need to make sure that everyone all around the world has access to the best vaccines. Um, this isn't a time when uh, one country should be trying to be ahead of others. We should all be trying to protect humanity here because we depend on each other. Um, so what I worry about most is that the pandemic is going to go longer than it needs to because people cannot come around a table and agree to share and solve the problem together because we need to make sure the vaccines available in Africa in Bangladesh, in India, in Russia, wherever, all over. And what scares me is that the vaccine rollout is seems to be much slower in some countries than others. Brazil is really a bad situation right now from everything I hear. And the vaccine will stop the pandemic. We already see that. I mean, I am, I'm, the case numbers are already coming down. There's little spikes in the United States, but every indication I have is right. that the vaccines will control the pandemic. They won't eliminate the virus, but they'll eliminate the disease. Right, right. And, and that, that's, a, that's, that's a very uh, hopeful note to end on. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Camel uh, joining us from uh, Louisiana. Uh, thank you so much for joining me and hope to speak to you again. Thank you very much for having me on. Have a great day and stay healthy, everyone. Bye. Thank you.